Man, do I feel like teaching. Let me just say, before I go into the Word of God, though, let me just, uh, I want to give a big shout out and uh, congratulations. Some of you know Eliseo Hernandez and his beautiful wife, Kristen. They just welcomed in a new baby boy, Samuel Joseph, is uh, here. And uh, I doubt that he's watching, though I will tell you that when the, new, when, the, when the guys on staff, the young ones have kids, I typically will text them sometime that week about 2 a.m. and say, I know you're up right now. And so I just want to say good morning. So I'm sure Eliseo is up somewhere. Uh, so if you have his phone number, text him about 2, 3 a.m. if you want. But no, uh, pray for them. Uh, pray for the family. And how many thank God for how he's adding to our church. Amen. Towards that end, in your bulletin, if you just pull out your bulletin for one second, there is two inserts. One was short-term missions. The other was new members who joined the church. And uh, man, pray for those folks. Pray for those families. Uh, we could be a big church. I was meeting with a family in between service and they said, we love Woodside, such a big place. And I know that that's true, but uh, through our life groups and uh, through our classes, hopefully you can get plugged in in a deeper and more intimate way to make a, a big church feel more personal. Uh, but we do pray that you would pray for those who have joined our church family. Let's do that now. Father, thank you. What a precious thing to see people being baptized, coming to faith in you, turning from sin to Christ for salvation and becoming a part of the Woodside family. And Lord, we just pray that the, they would be fruitful. We pray your protection and hand a blessing upon them. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, how many came today excited about the word of God? Amen. Well, I want you to join me back in the unfolding saga of the book of Daniel. I told you last week that one of the things that Hollywood writers do a great job of is building anticipation for a new series from one episode to the next. And I pray that your anticipation has been uh, growing as we've gone from one chapter to the next. Last week we were in Daniel chapter 4, which means this week we are in Daniel chapter... Five, that's impressive. That's good. So Daniel chapter 5, why don't you join me there, Daniel chapter 5. And I can't dive into chapter 5 without doing a little bit of a recap of chapter 4 because they really are connected. But let me just first give you a reminder of the big theme of the book. If you remember, we have been subtitling this A Clash of cultures, a class of cultures, and, and really it's kingdoms in conflict, as the late great Chuck Colson described it. It's worldviews. Two different worldviews are on display throughout the book. Um, there is humanism and this thought that uh, man is the highest and greatest thing there is in all the universe, that we are the apex of everything, and that with our ingenuity, our creativity, our innovation, we will solve all problems, that in essence we are God. Now, often humanism comes with this veneer of spirituality. It is um, a professed spirituality. There are the gods, if you will, but these gods that are out there really are not people that we are submitted to, but really gods that we can control, and we'll see that in just a moment. But the competing worldview, which you and I would adopt, would be a Christian worldview, Christian theism as opposed to humanism. Christian theism says, no, God is sovereign that he created us, that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. He is the maker of heaven and earth. He is king of kings. He is Lord of lords and the only one who is worthy of our worship and our praise. How many believe that with all of your heart? Now, these worldviews were in conflict, not just in Daniel's day, but these worldviews are in conflict in our day. Is humanity the Lord of all things and humanism the right way of living our lives, believing that science and innovation and technology has displaced the need for God? Is God dead in essence or is God very much alive? Is he sovereign over not only history, sovereign over kingdoms? and sovereign over our lives. I hope you'll answer 
yes and amen to that. But as we turn to chapter 5, we'll remember in chapter 4 that it was King Nebuchadnezzar that was this proud king of Babylon, this great kingdom. You could argue that Babylon is the greatest kingdom that the world has ever seen in a lot of ways. It still influences us today. The wisdom and technology and the innovation of the Babylonians are felt from everything from watches to art to aesthetics and science even. The Babylonians were a great empire and uh, still have influence today. And here Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 4 is warned by Daniel, this man of God, that king, the, the, God has said that if you don't humble yourself, you're going to be judged. And yet, knowing that God had warned him, he ignored it. How often are we guilty of ignoring the warnings of God? I know I'm guilty of that so often. Nebuchadnezzar was guilty of that. He ignored the warnings of God. And one day, he stands on his palace porch. He looks over the kingdom, and he says, look at this great kingdom that I have built with my own hands. And how often do we do that? We look at our lives, and we say, look at what I've done. Look at the uh, riches I've been able to amass. Look at the accomplishments, the degrees, the, uh, the job achievements, whatever the case may be. Look at what I've done. And just as God promised and warned, he humbled Nebuchadnezzar and he went out of his mind. For seven years, he had lost all rationality and began to behave like an animal. And that's the definition of losing your mind. You can lose your mind and not even know it. The definition of losing your mind is when we begin to behave just like animals. And what do animals do? They pursue their appetites without discretion or, dis or discernment. So whenever a group of people pursue uh, appetites without discretion or dis discernment, then we're behaving no different than the animals and we are officially out of our minds no matter if we all agree that we're saying. And so Nebuchadnezzar was humbled for seven years. He was humbled. And then ultimately he cries out to God, acknowledges that God is the Lord. He's restored in his right mind. And he writes an open letter to his kingdom. And every kingly letter that was ever written in Babylon was preserved for the generations to come. Now, why is all of that important? It's because chapter 5 we pick up, it happened somewhere between 35 to 70 years after chapter 4, and Nebuchadnezzar is dead now. He is no longer alive. His grandson is on the throne, and his grandson is named Belshazzar. We're going to read a story about his grandson, and really the question we're going to take up today is, what happens when we reject God's reign? What happens? when we reject God's reign. We've been saying that God is sovereign over ungodly kings and kingdoms. How many believe that? And let me just say as a parenthetical statement, I hope you believe that, especially in an election year. The, the reality is, is after Super Tuesday, half of us are going to wake up disappointed, the other half happy, but there will be neither a Messiah or Antichrist elected. There will just be a man. There'll just be a politician maybe a woman, who, who knows, but there will be a leader that's elected, right, and they will be human. But you know who is unelectable and unimpeachable, who reigns forever and ever and ever? His name is Jesus, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And I pray that we will not lose sight of his sovereignty, and that's how we pre prevent making politicians into messiahs or antichrists. I think that's a word, antichrist. No, maybe not. The Antichrist. My wife would have corrected me later. <laughs> Belshazzar is a king who rejects the um, reign of God, and he commits three, three acts. First, he blasphemes the Most High God. Look at the first 12 verses of chapter 5. King Belsh uh, Belshazzar made a great feast for a thousand of his lords, and drank wine in front of the thousand. Belshazzar, when he tasted the wine, commanded that the vessels of gold and silver that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem be brought that the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought the golden vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his lords and wives and his concubines 
concubines drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, and stone. Immediately, the finger of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace opposite the lampstand on, and uh, opposite the lampstand. And the king saw the hand as it wrote. Then the king, king's color changed and his thoughts alarmed him and his limbs gave way and his knees knocked together. Verse number seven, the king called loudly to bring the enchanters and the Chaldeans and the astrologers. The king declared to the wise men of Babylon, whoever... Uh, reads this writing and shows me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around his neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the writing or make known to the king the interpretation. Uh, then King Belshazzar was greatly alarmed and his color changed and his, and his uh, lord were perplexed. The queen, because of uh, the words of the king and his lords, came into the banqueting hall, and the queen declared, O king, live forever. Let not your thoughts alarm you or your color change. Th there is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. In the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, were found in him. And the king Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father, the king, made, known, made him, rather, chief of the magicians, enchanters, Chaldeans, and astrologers, because an excellent spirit, knowledge, and understanding to interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve problems were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now, let Daniel be called, and he will show the interpretation. Clearly, we see what is going on here. And before I dive into just an explanation of the text, let me just give one definition of a word. Is that whenever you see the word father in this text, it really means predecessor. It's the way that they refer to all of their predecessors. So to Israel, by the way. The, if you notice throughout the Old Testament, Israel would say, we are the sons and daughters of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham is our father. It's a way of just describing lineage. So Nebuchadnezzar was his grandfather, not his direct father, but nonetheless, he is connected to, to Nebuchadnezzar. And so here Belshazzar is throwing a party. You can see the party, right? And it's a party to celebrate the greatness of his kingdom, and he, in particular, his own greatness. But if, if throwing a party for a thousand people was not enough to be celebrated, he had to up the ante, if you will. He had to show how powerful he was, that there was no one more powerful than him. So he says to his servants, go get the holy vessels from the God of the Jews. That's where he made a mistake. And so they went and got those gold vessels and they brought it back to him and to show how powerful he was, that there was nothing greater than him, he drank from those vessels, thereby blaspheming God. What does it mean to blaspheme God? It means to either speak of him disrespectfully or to disrespect what belongs to him. What made those vessels special was not the vessel itself. What made those vessels special is that they belong to God. By the way, that's what makes your body special. Know you not that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, that your body belongs to God? This is why we honor God with our bodies. That's what makes this day special, that this is the Lord's day. So we gather together on the Lord's day. That's what makes, by the way, giving special. I know that we stand before you week after week and we talk to you about generosity and giving and we encourage you, but the Bible is clear that the first fruits belong to the Lord. They are his. 
And what Belshazzar forgot and what I pray that we don't forget is that there are certain things that are holy. The message of chapter 5 that the world or the culture of the Babylonians wants to send to us is that there's nothing holy anymore, that there's nothing sacred anymore, that humanity is all that is and was and will ever be. And by the way, that's the same message that's being sent to our kids in this day and age, that there is nothing holy anymore. And so you can take the Lord's name in vain and there will be no consequences. There is nothing holy anymore, so you don't have to give the first fruits to the Lord because there'll be no consequences. There is nothing holy anymore. You don't have to go to church on the Lord's day. That's, by the way... Uh, a day just for the NFL or for football. That's it. You just eat until you pass out on the couch. That's all Sundays are for. There is nothing holy anymore. But the message of God in Daniel chapter 5 is pumped the brakes. There is something holy. That God is holy and that he expects his people to remember that. Earlier, I said to you that the primary responsibility we have for our lives, for our children, and for our children's children is to remember and to remind them because once the memory fades, we begin to blaspheme God. When the memory fades that we didn't create ourselves, that we're not here because of random forces, but that a holy God created us, when the memory fades, then we begin to act blasphemously. And this is what men will always do to prove how tough they are, how great they are. His greatness was enough. He was already king. He didn't need to show off this way. Not only does he get drunk, but notice that it says that he drunk in front of the thousand people that he gathered together. In other words, he wanted all eyes on him. You know, it kind of reminds me of an act of modern day blasphemy. I don't expect for all of you to keep up with the popular artists of our day, but some of you will know the name Little Nas X when I say that name. And if you don't know that name, don't Google it. (laughs) But for, for those of you who do know, he's really one of the most popular artists, musicians of our day. Uber talented, very gifted. Just to give you a feel, uh, his videos have been viewed and estimated over 500 million times, half a billion times. But if that popularity was not enough for him, he continues album after album to blaspheme God. In his last album, he made a video where he descends to hell and parties with the devil. And if that wasn't enough, in this most recent album, he dresses up like a scene out of The Last Supper as if he is Jesus partying with the disciples, putting back shots and blaspheming God. This is the culture that we're in, so don't think that what we're reading is just something that's ancient, obsolete, outdated. No, we live in a day and age where talented, gifted people continue to blaspheme God, and the message that's sent to our children is nothing's holy and there is no consequence, but you and I have been called to be the alarm system of a generation. We've been called to be that annoying alarm system that says, but wait a minute, wake up. Don't be asleep. Awake, O sleeper, and know that God is holy. And so a hand appears. It's the hand of God. It's the same hand in Exodus 31 and 18 that wrote Ten Commandments on two tablets and gave them to Moses. And he knew that there was something supernatural, something greater than him with this hand, so much so that in verse number six it says, when he saw the hand, his color changed. His limbs gave way. His knees began to knock. This man was totally beside himself. And so who are you going to call? Not Ghostbusters. You don't call in the enchanters. You don't call the astrologers. Tell me what this means. And I don't know if it's so much that they couldn't tell him or that they wouldn't tell him because the interpretation is an interpretation and nobody would ever want to tell a king. But then the, the queen mother walks in and says to him, don't be afraid. There is one who knows how to interpret gifts and, uh, I'm sorry, dreams and visions. He's been given this gift from God. Call on him. His name, by the way, we called him Belteshazzar 
but his Hebrew name is Daniel. We're going to get to this Daniel in just a moment. I just want to say to you, be careful not to blaspheme God. Let this be a warning to you and to me to honor his name as holy. Your name is the highest. Your name is the greatest. Your name stands above them all. All powers and dominions, all thrones and positions, your name stands above them all. Let the angels sing holy. Let the people sing holy. We just sang that together. And I pray that the melodic tunes and the great instrumentality didn't drown out the message. God is holy. And may that be the message we give to our children and our children's children. May we continue to remind them that God is holy, and that's why we pray before we eat, so that we might remind ourselves that our food is a gift from him. God is holy, that's why we go to church, so that we might remind ourselves that this day is special unto the Lord. God is holy, that's why we give from our first fruits to advance the gospel so that we might remind ourselves that every good gift comes from the Father who is above. How many today acknowledge that he is King of kings, Lord of lords, and sovereign over your life? But the other thing that we do when we reject God's reign is we repeat the sins of the past. We repeat past sins. Look at verse number 13. Then Daniel was brought in before the king. The king answered and said to Daniel, you are that Daniel, one of the exiles of Judah, whom the king, my father, brought from Judah. I have heard of you, that the spirit of the gods is in you, and that the light and, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. Now the wise men, the enchanters, have been brought in before me to read this writing and make known to me its interpretation. But they could not show the interpretation of the matter. But I have heard that you can give interpretations and solve problems. Man, I pray that that would be the testimony of God's people, that we can solve problems. And pray that God would anoint us to do that in this day and age. He goes on to say, if you can read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, you shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around your neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then Daniel answered and, sa and said before the king, let your gifts be for yourself and give your rewards to another. Nevertheless, I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. O king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar, your father, kingship and greatness and glory and majesty. And because of the greatness that he gave him, all peoples, nations, and languages trembled in fear before him. Whom he would, he killed, and whom he would, he kept alive. Whom he would, he raised up, and whom he would, he humbled. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened so that he dealt proudly, he was brought down from his kingly throne and his glory was taken from him. He was driven from among the children of mankind and his mind was made like, the, like that of a beast and his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. He, he was fed grass like an, uh, like an ox and his body was wet with the dew of heaven until he knew that the most high God rules the kingdom of mankind and sets over it whom he will. That's the message. Heaven rules, that God rules. Verse number 22 is the key verse of the entire chapter. And you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, though you knew all this. Verse 23. But you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven, and the vessels of the house have been brought in before you, and you and your lords, your wives, your concubines have drank, drunk wine from them, and you have praised the gods of silver and gold and bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which do not see or hear or know, but the God, uh, but the God in whose hand is your breath and whose are all 
all your ways you have not honored. Notice the exchange of who to worship. That he rejected the God who holds his breath in life, who is in control over all things. Instead, he praised the God of gold, vessel, and silver. Why? Because he could hold gold, vessel, gold, silver, and iron. He could hold those things. In other words, we love to worship gods that we can control. We, this is the appeal of alternative spiritualities. The appeal of alternative spiritualities is that they aren't demanding on us. They, they don't demand of us holiness. No, they are things that we can control. It really is humanism with a veneer of spirituality. It really is our way of saying, man, I want to do what I want to do while still holding on to a spark of the divine or something mysterious or something spiritual, but you're really not fooling anybody. What you really want to do is control the gods you worship. But this God, our God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the sovereign Savior and resurrected Lord Jesus Christ, cannot and will not be controlled by man. All of the heavens cannot contain him, and we will never outwit or outsmart him. He is Lord over all. I love the fact that though Daniel has been given a Babylonian name, and they've been calling him Belteshazzar, when he comes in at this moment, the king is so shook by that human hand he saw that he refers to him by his Hebrew name. Daniel, I need help. I need help. And what this king didn't realize is that his pride caused him to ignore the fact that his kingdom at that time was already in danger. He didn't realize that doomsday was already approaching. You see, outside of his kingdom, a Persian army was forming. And that Persian army was going to mount an attack that we'll see in a moment that will cause his kingdom to fall in a day. But here he is partying. He didn't know he was losing his kingdom. He's partying and didn't know he was losing his kingdom. How many times have I had a husband and wife come into my office for counseling and the wife says, we've been having problems for a long, long time, much to the surprise of the husband. And he looks at me like, Pastor, I thought everything was great. I didn't know I was losing my marriage. May God wake us up to what we're losing. How many of us are busy working, demanding jobs, and don't realize we are losing our children while the world takes them through social media and the internet? How many times have we been guilty, have I been guilty, you've been guilty of partying while we're in danger of losing the very blessing of God? Let me just say this, friends. That the goal of not life is not to just be blessed, it's to keep the blessing. What good is it if God blesses you with a home only for it to be foreclosed on later? What good is it for God to bless you with a job only for you to be fired later? What good is it for God to bless you with a marriage only to go through a divorce later? You see the point. The point is, is that we don't want to just be blessed, but how many want to keep the blessing? How many want to maintain the blessing? And the way that we maintain the blessing is to honor the Lord. It is to reverence him. It is to make sure that he is at the center of all things. Belshazzar lost sight of that. There's another thing about these names that I want you to make sure you notice. Notice how closely those names are tied to one another. Belshazzar, the king's name, Belteshazzar, Daniel's Babylonian name. Only two letters separate them. And while there's only two letters of difference between their, their names, there's a world of difference between their characters. Look at verse number 17 again. Daniel answered and said before the king, let your gifts be for yourself and give your rewards to another in other words, I don't perform at your pleasure for profit. I won't prostitute my gifts to the highest bidder. Be careful who you take gifts from. Don't take gifts from people who just want to manipulate you or control you into doing things that you know are a violation of conscience. Surrender yourself to the Lord. That's the message of verse number 17. Now, Daniel said, I will interpret the dreams for you or the vision for you or these words for you, but not because you offer me any money. I don't need your money. As a matter of fact, you don't even realize it yet, King, but your money is worthless. 
because your kingdom is about to fall. But I will do it for God. God has called me to this moment. I will surrender my gifts to God. Remember, it was in chapter 1 that he was trained in the language, the science, uh, the wisdom of the Chaldeans. So now he's being called on to use that gift. I want to say to every young person in here, go to university, go to college, get training, or if you don't go to college, get some certification, grow, be brilliant, but be brilliant for Jesus. Use your gifts. If you can write, write. If you're a creative, be creative. If you're a musician, be a musician. If you're an artist, be an artist. If you're a cook, cook for Jesus. But use them all for the Lord. If you're going to be a social media influencer, then do it for the Lord. Tweet for Jesus. Amen? Amen. But, but do it all for the Lord. Daniel was gifted from God, and he used his gifts to honor the Lord. And God blessed him. And so he says to this king, verse 22, you should have learned from the past. You, you know the past. And one of the things I love about the book we're studying is that it's one of the most verified books by archaeologists. That not only is this book spiritually true, it has been proven to be historically accurate. As a matter of fact, archaeologists have found documents from the Babylonian Empire that tracks all of their successive kings. So all of the history of Daniel has been verified by science. Isn't it great to know that even science testifies to the accuracy of the word of the living God? God. Amen. And so these documents, this that, that Nebuchadnezzar, his grandfather, would have wrote, written this open letter, he would have known about this. He would have known that his grandfather testified of his pride and how his pride humbled him and God had to restore him, and, and he didn't learn the lesson. May we learn the lessons of those who come before us. But let me also talk to those of us who have children and grandchildren. May we teach the lessons, not just of our success, but also our, of, of our humility. Not just of our victories, but also our failures. I love that Nebuchadnezzar said, I want every generation after me to know what it's like when you fail God. How many don't want your kids or grandchildren to repeat your mistakes? I don't want my kids and grandchildren to repeat my financial mistakes, my family mistakes, my faith mistakes. I don't want them to repeat those mistakes. But if all I give them is the stories of my high school days when I was young and skinny and had hair and scored five touchdowns on the football team and had the high score on the basketball game, if all they know is the successes from your past, then it won't benefit them as much as when you sit them down and say, let me tell you when I have blown it. I know it's not popular, but if you want to preserve their lives, do for the, the next generation what Nebuchadnezzar tried to do for Belshazzar, to tell them, this is where I have blown it, but God stepped in and rescued me and restored me and forgave me. It's a but God story, but we got to tell our part of how we have struggled, or else they'll live with this false veneer of perfection that somehow mom has never struggled with sexual decisions or dad has never blown it morally, or we have never been tempted or strayed from God. But the truth of the matter is, is that we have strayed from God. But even in my straying, he was faithful. Even when I wandered for him, he pursued me, he chased me down, and he restored me. Let that be our testimony. And it tells me something else about what was going on with Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 4. That while it felt like it was all about Nebuchadnezzar, it was really God at work in his failure to preserve in hopes a future generation. And for those of you who are going through a tough season, those of you who are going through a valley, may you know that it's not all about you, but sometimes God lets us go through valleys because he wants to give us a story for the next generation to help them through it. Nebuchadnezzar was going through, yes, in part because of his pride, but also because God had his grandson in mind. And when you and I go through, sometimes God has the next generation in mind. So never waste a trial, never waste a tribulation. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because he is with me. He's Emmanuel, not just on the mountaintop of success, but in the valley of failure as well. 
But if you are a Belshazzar in here, a son, a daughter, a grandson, granddaughter, learn from the past. Learn from the mistakes. It's a fool that says, I got to repeat what somebody else has already paid the price for. Well, the final thing that came because he rejected God's sovereignty was judgment. Look at verse number 34, or yeah, verse number 24. Then from his presence, the hand was sent, and this writing was inscribed, and this is the writing that was inscribed, Mene, Mene, Tekel, and Parsin. This is the interpretation of the matter. Mene, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balance and found wanting. Per se, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Then Belshazzar gave the command and Daniel was clothed with purple and a chain of gold and it was put around his neck and the proclamation was made about him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom that night that very night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was killed, and, and Darius, the Mede, received the kingdom and, uh, and being about 62 years old. I love that the scripture gives exact age. What a historical book we're reading. It's beautiful. He gave him all these gifts, but they weren't even his to give. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. I want to invite you to stand. As, as we stand, I want to pray. But I want you to remember the handwriting on the wall. Because this hand has shown up throughout Scripture. It showed up with the Ten Commandments as God wrote on two tablets in Exodus 31, 18. But it also showed up when this woman was called in adultery in John chapter 8, verse number 8. It was the hand of Jesus writing in the sand as men stood around her with stones in their hand. And whatever he wrote caused them to throw those stones down and walk away one by one. For her, the finger wrote grace. For Belshazzar, the finger wrote judgment. What will the finger of God write about you and me? Will it be judgment or will it be grace? Will we accept the mercy of Christ offered to us on the cross or will we reject his reign? choice is up to us. But I pray today that you will choose life and that you will follow Jesus. And if today you want to choose life, we'd love to pray with you, wrap our arms around you as you take your next steps with Jesus. There'll be leaders at the front and also in the lobby. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you for the promise of your sovereign reign. Thank you that you are in control. Thank you that you will offer us warning so that we might turn from sin to Christ for salvation. May that be so today. We love you in Jesus' name. And all God's people with a loud voice said, amen, amen. and amen. God bless you. Greet somebody in love and you are dismissed. If you're in need of prayer, we'll be here to pray with you.